was um, written by Antonio Machado. And it goes like this. Wanderer, your footsteps are the road and nothing more. Wanderer, there is no road. The road is made by walking. By walking, one makes the road, and upon glancing behind, one sees the path that never will be trod again. Wanderer, there is no road, only wakes upon the sea. So there are two books that use that poem. One of them is from my favorite educator named Paulo Freire, who has this dialogue with... Um, uh, African American educator and they talk about what does it mean to teach in a way that is um, empowering to the people being taught that doesn't try to transform them into something different than what they want and and they use that poem as the title of the book that they don't know how to teach this new form of education but they make the way as they teach people Brian McLaren also used this poem to influence a book he wrote that was to help teach us how to live the Christian life in a way that hadn't been taught before. And so he uses that poem to talk about, we make this road, this Christian life, but we don't know what the road will look like how it will change and transform as we are walking it, as we are living our lives. And many of us in this room have seen how the road has changed just in our lifetime. But we don't know what comes next, what it will look like. But what we can do is follow the way that Jesus walks. Follow the path that he sets on. And so this summer, we're going to look at stories and in the story, Jesus is going to walk into the scene. Why does that occur as a metaphor throughout the Gospels? Jesus walks in what we call the way. That the early Christians were called people of the way. People who walk the way that Jesus walked. Who followed the path and the road that Jesus set out. And one of the things that I think we as the church need to do is get back to that way of walking with Jesus. To take seriously the ways he showed us to be, the ways he practiced the faith. And so today, as Jesus sets out on his walk, he encounters a tax collector. Now, this is not the IRS agent, although most of us, if the IRS agent sent us a letter saying that we had to come into the office would be quivering because we're like, oh no, they're going to make me pay more money that I don't have, right? But in, in Jesus' time, under the Roman Empire, those tax collectors made their living by taking extra, okay? So in order to pay the bills for themselves, they would take a little bit of more from everybody they collected taxes with so that they could have enough money to survive. Although in their case, a lot of times they took enough extra that they hurt the people they were taking money from and they lived a life better than the people around them. And so when Jesus stops to talk to the tax collector, he's talking to somebody that everybody else in town is like, I can't stand that guy. But they can't stand him for a number of reasons, right? One, he often cheats them by taking way more money than he should. And two, he's a collaborator. Do you know what that means? Like in, in empires, in order to make the people of a society conform to that empire, they find people in the local community to be the agents of the state. Instead of bringing in all these outsiders, right? they take local people and put them into positions of power. Mm -hmm. So that the empire, which is oppressing the people, 
is seen as a local extension of those oppressing the people. So the tax collector is one of those collaborators. He works with the empire to oppress the people. And so Jesus sees him and says to him, follow me. He doesn't look at that man and say, you're a collaborator, you're the enemy, you are cheating people. He looks at that man and says, follow me. Like he had just said, follow me to those fishermen. And the man got up and followed. And then he decides to hold a feast for Jesus, at which he invites all his friends. So he's eating there at dinner with more collaborators and others, it says. Others. Probably Gentiles, probably other Roman people, not Jewish people, but others who are outside of the local community. And there at the dinner, Jesus is eating with tax collectors, and when the religious folk come by, they say, and sinners. They say, how can you eat with these people? How can you eat with someone who is hurting us? How can you sit down at the table with our worst nightmares? And Jesus says, I have come not for the righteous, but for those who need me, for the sinners. I'm going to share a story with you that you may have heard before. It's from Tony Campolo, who is a sociologist that taught at Eastern University. And he trained a lot of people who are very um, famous in, in new ways of thinking about Christianity amongst the evangelical community. And Tony Campolo tells a story about a trip to Hawaii. So he's from the East Coast, and that means he had to fly to Hawaii. So you know, when you fly to Hawaii from the East Coast, 9 o'clock in the morning is like 3.30 in the morning in Hawaii, right? So when you first get there, your body is all mixed up, right? And, and because you're from the East Coast, you're like starving because it's 9 o'clock in the morning, but it's really 3.30 in the morning. So he says, he sets out to find something to eat, but it's 3.30 in the morning, so everything is closed, right? There's nothing open, and he finds the only greasy spoon diner he can see. And when he goes in, he looks at it and is not sure he really wants to eat there. So he orders a cup of coffee and a donut because he's thinking it can't be too bad. But then the guy, the big burly guy who wipes his hand on his apron, picks the donut without tongs up and gives it to him. And while he's worried about dying from whatever is on that donut, into the greasy spoon, at 3.30 in the morning come a group of loud, boisterous prostitutes. And they surround him, sitting everywhere. And he's trying to figure out how he can get out of this situation of being surrounded by all these loud women. And the one who sits down next to him says to the person next to her, Tomorrow's my birthday. I'm going to be 39. And the woman next to her says, What, do you want a party? You want us to celebrate your 39th birthday? And Agnes says, Why do you have to be so mean? I'm just telling you, tomorrow's my birthday. Tomorrow is my birthday. And I have never 
in my life had a birthday party. So the women continue eating and talking, and Tony sits there. And after they all leave, he says to Harry, can we throw Agnes a birthday party? Does she come in every day at this same time? And he says, yes. And Tony says, I will get all the stuff, the balloons and the decorations and make a sign and I'll buy a cake. And Harry says, no, 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 I'll take care of the cake. So the next morning, because, you know, he's still wide awake at 3 o'clock in the morning, he comes in and decorates the entire diner with birthday party favors. And pretty soon it's clear that Harry and the cook have told everyone that there is going to be a party because the entire place fills up with every prostitute in Honolulu. And at 3.30, Agnes, Agnes walks in. Agnes walks in and sees this sign that says, happy birthday. And she starts crying and shaking. And everybody sings happy birthday to her. And then they invite her to blow out the candles on the cake. And they ask her to do it. And then Harry says, well, I got to blow them out. So he blows out the candles. as they go to cut the cake. Can I take the cake with me? Can I take this cake home because I'm not sure I want to eat it right now? Can I take this cake home? And they say, sure, go ahead. We'll wait right here with your party. And so she gingerly carries that cake out to bring it to her mother who lives down the street. They celebrate Agnes's birthday. And after everyone has again left, Harry says to Tony, oh, I forgot a point. As Agnes is on her way, Tony says, can we say a prayer for her? Because, you know, they're in the midst of party and all of a sudden the person they're celebrating is gone. And so Tony prays. <laughs> he prays for Agnes. He prays for her to be surrounded by God to be loved and cared for. He prays for her to experience the power of Jesus' presence. And so after everyone leaves, Harry says to Tony, I didn't realize you were a preacher. What kind of preacher are you? And Tony says, this is the one time the words that I needed at the exact moment I wanted to say them popped into my head. And he says, I belong to the kind of church that throws birthday parties for whores at 3.30 in the morning. And Harry says, I don't believe you. There's no church like that. If there was a church like that, I would join it. That's what our story from Jesus is about today. Looking at the people that society says aren't welcome. That we look down on or push aside and say, you're invited into the party. You're invited into this place to have a meal with us. So think about that. Who is it? that you don't want sitting next to you right now. Some of you have already claimed that second seat, so you don't have room for that person. But who is it? Who is in that empty seat that needs a church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning? That's an important question for us to ask, right? Who is it that needs a church that says our doors are open, 
that we are open to bringing the presence of God to you no matter who you are. I mean, one of the things I thought about, and it's probably because the algorithm knows who I am, right? So it chooses what kind of stories I see. And one of the places of real pain right now in our, in our culture is among trans parents and trans people. What if we are the church that says, you're welcome here? What if we're the church that says you're loved no matter what your pronouns are? That's who we claim to be. How do we live that out? How do we say to those kids who are being told that their parents will be taken from them if they speak words out loud? How do we throw them a party? A party celebrating their new name and new identity. Who else would be sitting next to you in the pew? Jesus walked by and invited the tax collector in. Who would you invite in? Who do you see as the enemy, the collaborator? The person who needs to hear the word of God more than anything else. So I admit I have mixed feelings about this. But that God holding the Christian flag in the video, if you saw it Thursday night, as they're tearing through the Capitol and hurting people. That God holding the Christian flag, we need to invite him into the church. Because the Christian nationalism that he learned is not the faith of Jesus. We need to invite him in so he can hear who Jesus is. Who Jesus has invited into this space who Jesus has called us to be. And if we're to walk with Jesus, our job is to even invite that guy carrying the Christian flag right next to a Confederate flag. But not, not so that we can accept Christian nationalism, but so that we can show the love of God the love of Jesus, so that we can say to those who need to be transformed and changed by the love of God, that Jesus came. Jesus came not just for the righteous and the religious. Jesus came so that those of us who have made mistakes, and let me tell you, all of us have made mistakes, all of us have turned from what God has called us to be and do. All of us have done those things that push us farther away from God. But Jesus, in those moments, invites us to turn around and turn back and become part of the community again. To walk with God, even when it is hard. Even when those people challenge everything we believe and stand for, we're invited to walk with God on this new journey, to create this new road, this road that will be different, but this road that shows a church on the move, a church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning. Amen.